The collapse of the Soviet Union is something a lot of people consider to be an external factor. A pressure from the Cold War caused the country to ultimately fall in on itself and collapse. This is not the case. The fall of the Soviet Union can actually be more attributed to an internal factors that had built up throughout the nation's existence. The introduction of policies to open up the apparatus of state to be more open with the general populace during the Gorbachev era, called Glasnost, coupled with a stagnating economy, opened the Soviet people to the true state of their nation. And during this great stagnation and opening of public discourse, the Soviet Union suffered a series of politically and economically damaging events that would further place strain on the state. Following all of the events that occurred, the Chernobyl disaster, the Afghan war, which is a mess in itself, and, and more, the Soviet Union was doomed to fail. It was not coming back. It was quite literally a house of cards that had fallen in. Within modern Russia, Mikhail Gorbachev is generally viewed quite unfavourably, particularly by the Russian government and also the people. I distinctly remember being there and having a photo of him on a wall in the city of Irkutsk being pretty heavily vandalised. This is due to the policies of Gorbachev being blamed both correctly and incorrectly for the Soviet Union's collapse in 1991. The Soviet Union inherited by Gorbachev on the death of his predecessors though, was in a dire situation. The economy was stagnated, poverty was on the rise, alcoholism was basically Tuesday, and crucially, a very expensive, unpopular war was being fought in Afghanistan. In 1985, Gorbachev actually gave a speech in Leningrad where he publicly admitted to the Soviet people and effectively the world that the economy had stagnated and it needed reform. He spoke openly about the human factor and he introduced policies and reforms known as, this is a fun word, Uskurs, nope, I'm, gonna, I'm putting it on screen, not bothering, putting it on screen. The idea was that through restructuring, perestroika, and transparency, glasnost, the Soviet Union would be able to evolve and survive into the modern world with new political thinking, commercialization, democracy, all the fun stuff. These reforms, though, well, they were a bit different to the Soviet policies of the past. A clear indicator of how much the Soviet Union really changed under Gorbachev was the fact that he was heckled publicly by the people. The smelly individuals were able to talk to the general secretary. And they were able to say, like, for example, in Krasnoyarsk in 1988, Gorbachev was met with disgruntled citizens, with one woman saying, go into our shops, Mikhail Sergeyevich. You will see that there is absolutely nothing there. The very idea of the general secretary of the Communist Party, of the Soviet Union, being heckled so publicly was previously unheard of. And it's a clear indication of how much the information space between the USSR was changing. The social change coupled with the attempt at rapid reform of the system to decentralize the economy just further destabilized the USSR though and a lot of this was down to the top-down bureaucracy that really controlled the USSR and it was an absolute mess. It was a mess that was thrown at the feet of Gorbachev and in many ways there was no way Gorbachev was going to stop the fall from happening. Now the Soviet Union, the way its government worked, it's um it's interesting. It's complicated. It makes no sense to anyone who well, doesn't have a Soviet mindset, unless you spend like a week and a half throwing your head into it. But it's it's really a bit odd. Now, the Soviet Union was a top-down bureaucracy, with the state being centered around a powerful general secretary and wider Politburo. Nominally, the general secretary only controlled the Communist Party directly. But the Soviet Union was a one-party state, ergo the General Secretary was in charge and controlled the party that was the one party of the one-party state. So for all intents and purposes, the General Secretary is the dictator with total control. In order to maintain this control, the General Secretary and the Politburo relied on a series of councils, with each industry having a council and a series of deputy directors running top-down. A key example of this structure can be seen in the Ministry of Atomic Energy during the Gorbachev era with power centered around a powerful minister in Moscow and a series of less powerful ministers and ministries at different capitals at different SSRs as you get lower and lower and lower until you reach the individual nuclear power plant. Within the plant itself, there would be a series of similar positions until you reach the plant staff. The Chernobyl disaster would later highlight just how ineffective the structure could be, but it would also highlight the ability for scapegoating when it came to something going wrong ultimately protecting those at the top, namely the Politburo, the General Secretary, and the state itself. 
Side note, I'm calling it Chernobyl, not Chernobyl, using the Russified English version, not the Ukrainian English version for place names and such during this because we're talking about time inside the Soviet Union. It will make more sense as it goes along, but the idea is this is what it was known as at the time during the Soviet Union, which was effectively a Kremlin-run state, because it was, so I'm using the terminology that best fits the period. Please don't get your knickers in a twist about it. Further to this, these progressive de deputy directors and secretaries were unelected and put in place by people in more powerful positions. This kind of structure allowed the Soviet Union to survive scandals and caused by avoidable accidents. See the TU-104. The goal of the Soviet state and the reason for this kind of governmental structure was the theory of the collective state's goal. An example of this throughout Soviet history is the five-year plans and the centralization of the state's resources for what would be deemed to be the collective good. This rigid government structure though was not flexible and it would backfire pretty heavily during the Brezhnev era with the Soviet economies being able to provide in what would become known as the era of stagnation. After Stalin kicked the bucket and did the world a favour in 1953, the Soviet Union went through a period collectively known in the Western world as the Khrushchev Thaw. This period saw an end to the extremely repressive policies of the Stalinist era, and the Thaw also included fiscal reforms that would greatly benefit the Soviet economy. For example, they actually got a minimum wage during this period, and media, arts and culture were allowed to be developed further. And due to what can be described as a war on Stalin, because Khrushchev hated Stalin, <laughs> He really hated Stalin. He ended up alienating many of his supporters who held the God Emperor Stalin in high regard. I'm, I'm not being facetious. They, they genuinely, many of them thought Stalin was basically a God Emperor. One of these people was Leonid Brezhnev, who ousted Khrushchev in 64 as the leader. And although initially the Soviet economy would prosper, the reintroduction of Stalinist policies and the end of Khrushchev's thaw began to inhibit the USSR's economic growth. The slowing of the Soviet economy, coupled with the birth of a gerontocracy, you know, old people running the place, that's what that means, it just means you just have old people and not young people, it's the US Congress, within the Soviet Union, it furthered the lag being experienced by the USSR against its Western adversaries. Now, Brezhnev had a bit of a different way of reacting as well when people try to not be communist. He was a big fan of turning everyone into a bit of a pink mist. And in 1968, he did this in Prague and it really started to get a repressive. Like Bre Brezhnev believed in communism will be achieved and maintained in our allies and satellite states through the power of the tank. This is really where tankies sort of come from, this in Tiananmen Square. In an attempt to overcome the economic depression, the Soviet Union attempted large infrastructure projects, particularly in the field of atomic energy, to provide cheaper alternatives to power to the state. But when you try and build a nuclear power plant on a lack of resources and seven bottles of vodka, it doesn't exactly go well. And the lack of resources started leading to unsafe practices. With the previously mentioned levels of bureaucracy, as I mentioned, each trying to fulfill the orders that they were given from the one above them, and then give the orders to the ones below them. Doesn't matter how the order's done, just do it. An example of this is nuclear power plants in the Ukrainian SSR had their roofing sealed with highly flammable tar and signed off as complete. I'm sure this won't come back to bite us. The Afghanistan war, meanwhile, well, it would add to the USSR's woes in the era of stagnation, and it became an ulcer that was such a drain on the weakened state that something needed to be done about it. Now, the Soviet-Afghan war lasted just over nine years from 1979 to 1989. 
and it was a tremendous strain on Soviet resources. And it shattered the idea to the Soviet people that the Red Army was an invincible force. Partially because those people in the mountains somehow managed to get Stinger missiles and it sort of upset the balance of power. But the propaganda surrounding the infallibility of the Red Army, it had been in place since the Great Patriotic War, and you can still see it today. Like, like the amount of people who genuinely think Russia has a powerful army, and it's amazing, and it's the best thing in the world, and they won World War II single-handedly, it's, it's almost as annoying, and I say almost as annoying because it's not as common, as people who think that the United States won the war by itself. Like, we're, we're, we're almost at that level. But the, the propaganda surrounding the infallibility of the Red Army is mental. And the tremendous casualties and increasing brutality of the Soviet campaign, it came to the forefront of the Soviet information space. And the transparency that Gorbachev bought with him really allowed the size and scope of Soviet casualties in that war to be public knowledge, with a dead and wounded number between 80 to 90,000 young men. And the war became increasingly unpopular in the USSR and extremely costly. I just want to point that out. In nine years, 80 to 90,000 deaths. Good job, Putin. You beat the Soviet Afghan war. You absolute mad lad. You beat the Soviet Afghan war for horror. I... Good job. One of the tactics employed by the USSR during the Afghan war was to avoid casualties. It was common to just scorch the entire earth where the enemy was. Uh, this didn't exactly gel well with a lot of the men involved in the conflict, and uh, folk music began to take place again. The Soviets often express themselves through folk music, it's quite interesting, with uh, this one being a particular winner. <laughs> A crucial difference in the Gorbachev period was that unlike his predecessors, the Soviet leader was not a fan of, as Brezhnev was, turning people into a fine pink mist. In this sense, the policy of Glasnost actually damaged the USSR's stability because people actually sort of, sort of started to realize that, hey, I can protest and not die. This is pretty amazing. And these accumulating factors, both social, economic, really resulted in the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan in 1989 but the war had caused critical damage to the economy and stability, and it had broken that myth of the Invincible Red Army. The USSR had to realise for the first time that the Red Army could and had been defeated. The consequences of that era of stagnation really came to fruition, though, with the Chernobyl nuclear power plant disaster on April 26, 1986. <laughs> The destruction of the plant and the scale of the disaster was, in contrast to the promised policy of transparency, initially hidden from public view, including the nearby town of Pripyat. The Soviet news headline warning of the disaster spoke of an accident that was being handled by the government. It was not until days later, when a power plant in Sweden discovered high levels of radiation that had travelled from Soviet Ukraine, that the USSR was forced to admit that something bad had happened. The plant director Brukhanov was given the order to build the plant within an allotted time frame and to provide a certain level of power to the grid. Brukhanov wasn't a nuclear engineer, he just got told to build the power plant. To cut corners in an era where resources were scarce, he did what he had to do to meet his deadlines. He took actions such as using tar on plant roofs, and he also combined the containment buildings of reactors 3 and 4 to save money and meet deadlines. The Soviet RBMK reactor, in use at Chernobyl, was itself a fatally flawed design, and this was the root cause of the explosion. Its flaw was known due to an earlier accident at the Leningrad nuclear power plant, and it was hidden by the state police, the KGB, to protect Soviet interests. Similarly, the cause for the disaster at Chernobyl was hidden, and it wasn't until the nuclear scientist in charge of fixing the damn thing, and during the cleanup, Valery Lagasov committed suicide that his notes regarding the cause of the disaster was actually shared amongst the scientific community. Go Soviet Union. The attempted cover-up and the reaction of the Soviet states kind of led to the public opinion turning from, well, the government will keep us safe to, hmm... I think they might be bullshitting us. The, the simple fact about Chernobyl was that 
the Soviet economy couldn't handle it. It was so expensive, and Gorbachev himself calls it the nail in the coffin of the Soviet Union. The disaster really reveals to the Soviet citizens for the first time that their news sources that they relied on just, they weren't reliable. They could not be trusted anymore. And this is where we get to the weird part of the internal collapse. We all know that the Soviets love their propaganda. Big, big, big fans of it, especially when it came to anything to do with their military, anything to do with war, you know, that kind of stuff. Now, during the late Soviet Union, the use of the television had grown in popularity within major cities. And, you know, they actually had televisions that they didn't have to look through a giant, like, pane sheet of glass and water to, and a magnifying glass. They actually had proper televisions at this point. And Moscow and Leningrad in particular had a very, very big, roaring fan base of the TV. Now, advertising is a bit different in the Soviet Union. So, like, instead of having individual businesses, everything was state-run. So, advertisement is less at showing what people can buy rather than what's just available in your area. A significant amount of Soviet television and advertisement during this period originated from the Estonian SSR, from the director of Harry Egypt. Egypt's advertising showed the ideal Soviet lifestyle, which is very much based on propaganda that in the real-life Soviet Union was comfortable and prosperous and was amazing. However, he also did some weird stuff, like the chicken ad. I feel uncomfortable watching this. Now you have to watch it too. The economic situation though was getting so bad that Egypt's advertisement was now turning into a bunch of people watching down every day after a horrible day at work, earning not too much, sitting in their state-run apartment, seeing people flying around on amazing products that they could never dream of owning. Key example being the washing machine. There's a reason you see so many Russians stealing washing machines. And there's a reason why it's alleged that when Putin fled East Germany at the fall of the Soviet Union, he took his washing machine with him. The television and mass media provided the public citizenry with information in real time too, skipping that government filter. So Soviet citizens were able to watch in live the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Warsaw Pact. Further to this, as previously mentioned, the USSR under Gorbachev reacted less violently to protests. And the use of television showed the public that they could now engage in civil disobedience without being turned into, well, as I have said twice now, a fine pink mist. The failure of the Soviet propaganda and state-run media to enforce the state's control as it had throughout the history of the USSR led to people kind of realizing when Swan Lake was on TV, some shit was going down. And that's where the meme comes from, is in order to try and keep things stable, they just put on Swan Lake on the TV to keep people calm and going, oh no, they're definitely not going to figure out something's up right now. But all of these factors, and a lot of the TV is the reason behind it, and media is the reason behind it, is why when finally came push to shove, and Gorbachev tried to salvage the Soviet Union, the hardliners launched a coup. And the hardliners coup is what would finally do the Union in. <laughs> In a really last-ditch effort, in an attempt to salvage and restructure the Soviet Union, Gorbachev's administration planned and proposed the New Union Treaty, which would have decentralized much of the power from the USSR from Moscow 
and devolve the power to member states. Think like European Union with a bit more connections. The military is all connected. The states are a bit more independent though. It's, it's a bit complicated and it doesn't really matter um, because it never got signed. Because on the 20th of August, 1991, Soviet hardliners horrified at the thought of having to give up any power whatsoever launched a massive coup. Side note, one of the funniest things about the new union treaty was the new name of the Soviet Union. So for example, instead of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, it, they were considering Union of Soviet Sovereign Republics, just to keep the name USSR. They also considered Union of Sovereign States and a few other interesting ones as well. But they really wanted to keep the acronym USSR or CCCP as what we would see, but it's USSR. It just looks nice, apparently. It would have been cheaper for the rebrand, I suppose. Now, this coup, Swan Lake was put on TV, as it always was. But the ultimate goal of the coup was a reversal of the democratization and reforms undertaken by Gorbachev. And it was marked by a large military operation in Moscow and the removal of the general secretary from power. However, the seed was set. The democratization of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, say that 10 times, had previously elevated the independent Boris Yeltsin to the position of head of alcoholics, I mean head of state, and furthered the spread of a uniquely Russian, not Soviet, sense of national identity, which detractors of the coup were able to rally around. The failure of the plotters to capture Yeltsin sealed the coup and really the Soviet Union's fate. The failure of the plotters to capture Yeltsin sealed the coup's failure and cemented stability in Russia itself around the Russian head of state, not the Soviet head of state. Further to this, the replacement of the well-known Gorbachev by an unknown group of hardliners linked to the KGB who had clearly seized power furthered public mistrust and disapproval of the plotters. The destabilization of the central Soviet power following the end of the Warsaw Pact proved to be the final blow to the Soviet Union with individual member states expecting and wanting further independent power, but not under Moscow anymore, rather fully independent. The failed August coup, therefore, accelerated the internal collapse of the Politburo and the General Secretary's power, and the fall of the Soviet Union at this point it was just a matter of time. It was a foregone conclusion. Now, after the August coup attempt, major parts of the Soviet Union were moving towards independence. The Ukrainian SSR had, in the years leading up to the collapse of the USSR, had a growing movement for independence, and the relaxing of restrictions and censorship under the Gorbachev regime assisted this movement. In 1990, the officially banned Ukrainian nationalist song and soon to be national anthem of Ukraine was performed in a large concert hall in the city of Lviv. The August coup cemented this movement's progress and Ukraine, along with Azerbaijan, responded to the instability in Moscow by moving towards independence. The Baltic states, meanwhile, including Moldova, Georgia and Armenia as well, completely rejected the idea of the new union treaty in principle at all and demanded total independence before it was even signed. The rejection of the treaty by the coup and the core member states of the USSR truly singled the end of the union. Concurrently, in Russia itself, the adoption of national symbols such as the tricolor and the eagle by an independent non-communist government chosen by the Russian people in what was effectively a free and fair election assisted the birthing of a distinctly Russian identity, away from the Soviet identity. The rejection of the new Union Treaty, coupled with the existing national movements against communist rule, really set the conditions for the member states in the Soviet Union to reject Moscow entirely and to seek independence. By adopting non-communist symbols of nationhood, electing independent officials, and by choosing their own paths, these countries were able to leave the Union, and with the center, namely Russia, unable to hold any longer, the USSR's collapse was now unstoppable. To put it frank, the USSR fell internally. The external pressure faced by the Soviet Union during the Cold War required that strong internal structure to maintain the USSR's position at the head of the Warsaw Pact, and to hold together the individual socialist republics. But the August coup, while in many ways responsible for the dissolution of the Soviet Union, was merely a consequence of decades of increasingly weakening economic strength, and the failure of the Soviet political system to effect reform and change in any timely manner, well, it, it really sealed the Union's fate. <laughs>
Although certain levels of detente were achieved with the United States, the cost of maintaining an immense bureaucracy and military force was just too much for the Soviet Union to bear, and the public perception and belief in the Red Army's strength was shattered after the defeat in Afghanistan. These cumulative eff effects of the economy weakening, faith in the public system being weakened, and further heightened by the Chernobyl disaster, really laid bare to the public the state that the Soviet Union was in, and it collapsed based upon this weight. It truly was a case of it got so heavy that it fell in on itself. Oh no.